right, good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Radu Tayoi. I'm the program director here at YUP, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's presentation. For those that may be joining us for the first time, YUP is a nonprofit, non-political, and non-religious organization whose mission is to inspire, educate, and empower the Ethiopian professional community to be able to make a positive impact in the world. We're driven by the vision to build a strong community that shares ideas, skills, and resources to enrich lives. Tonight's webinar is brought to you by our personal development program. I'd like to welcome tonight's presenter, Matilda Reckford, Program Manager at the English for Heritage Language Speakers, or EHLS. As part of the Center for Applied Linguistics, Matilda will present tonight an overview of the EHLS program, and will share insights on skills to prepare non-native English speakers for careers and opportunities within the federal government. If you have any questions as the presentation progresses, please feel free to put them in the chat. We will address them in the middle or at the end of the presentation. With that said, Matilda, I'd like to thank you and welcome you and, and pass you uh, the stage here to go ahead and jump into it. Great, thank you so much. Very happy to be here and share this webinar with you today. So a little bit about uh, today's presentation. Uh, we're gonna talk about the English for Heritage Language Speakers program, what it offers and its requirement, and we'll get into detail a little bit about um, the application, talk a little bit about the skills, um, uh, the skills testing, and then um, we're going to talk uh, about professional skills that prepare, prepare non-native English speakers for careers in the federal government, and we'll cover resources and opportunities available to those who are interested in joining the federal workplace. Um, like uh, our colleague at Yep said, uh, please feel free to type any questions in the chat and I'll uh, stop along the way to um, answer some questions. So feel free to type as I'm presenting. So a little bit about the program. Um, so let me do an overview about EHLS program. What is EHLS? EHLS is a scholarship program which, uh, with a focus on professional English communication skills and career skills. The program trains advanced speakers of English to be effective communicators and strong candidates for federal jobs. It's hosted by Georgetown University in Washington, DC. Every scholar admitted to the program receives a full scholarship funded by the federal government. The program is eight months in length. The first six months are full-time on the Georgetown University downtown campus, and the final two months are part-time and online. Participants are native speakers of critical languages who have a strong interest in public service. EHLS scholars come from diverse cultural, educational, and professional backgrounds, but they are united by an interest and a commitment to public service. So why EHLS? EHLS was established because critical language skills are in high demand in the US government. There are other government sponsored programs to teach critical languages to native English speakers, but this is the only program designed to prepare individuals with native knowledge of critical languages for the federal workplace. So a brief background on the organization and history of EHLS. The, uh, the Defense Language National Security Education Office, or Delencio, provides funding. Um, it also might go by the name of NSEP, which I might refer to as uh, later. The Center for Applied Linguistics, where I work, oversees instruction and coordinates testing. Uh, the uh, Georgetown University provides instruction, and the Institute of International Education oversees the application process. EHLS started in 2006 and 2024 will be the 19th program year. So a little bit about the scholarship terms. Uh, scholarships are funded by Delencio. Um, each scholarship provides uh, full tuition and fees for the eight month academic program. And in addition, it also provides a living stipend. So that's $3,600 a month during the first six months of the program. And it goes to $1,200 a month during the last two months of the program, the online months. Uh, for scholars moving from outside the Washington DC area, EHLS can reimburse relocation fees up to $1,000. Other benefits include health insurance through Georgetown University, 
a laptop computer on which you complete you can complete your EHLS assignments and that you can keep after the program ends, and a certificate from Georgetown University upon successful completion of the program. And scholars must agree to the terms that we have outlined here. So full time attendance and successful completion of the academic program, agreement not to work during the full time portion of the academic program, and acceptance of a service requirement after completing the academic program. A little bit about eligibility. So you must be a US citizen at the time of application. You must be a nat native speaker of one of the languages listed here, and you must have professional language, professional level proficiency in that language. You must have advanced proficiency in English. Your proficiency in both English and your native language will be formally tested. And you must have a college degree that's at least a bachelor's degree. You must be able to use the internet, word processing programs, and PowerPoint. You must be able to commit to a full-time day program from January through June in Washington, D.C. at Georgetown University. And you must be willing to work for the federal government for one year in a position with national security responsibilities. It will be your responsibility to find that position. So here are some priority areas um, that some of our scholars have uh, sought employment in. Just going to pull up quick notes. Uh, so EHLS scholars are required to begin their job search within these departments. Any civilian or foreign service position within these departments will count towards your requirement. Uh, they don't necessarily need to be language enabled positions. Uh, and um, it's worth mentioning that scholars work in diverse fields, including cyber, finance, acquisitions, in addition to foreign affairs. Uh, so we definitely encourage you to think broadly about where you may be able to apply your skills. Here are some examples of where EHLS scholars have worked. So those are really diverse positions, ranging from language instructor to doing programmatic management or intelligence work. Um, you can note that the program analyst position was an exclusive job that um, our scholar had access to through the exclusive job opportunities that the program offers. If a scholar doesn't find a suitable position in one of the priority areas, they can petition to fulfill the service requirement through any position within the federal government that contributes to national security. After making a documented good faith effort to find a position in the government, awardees can pursue positions in education directly related to NSEP funded language study or geographical experience. Um, NSEP, like I said, that's the other acronym for Delencio, it's National Security Education Pro Program, uh, has a very broad understanding of national security, including issues of population and migration, public health, diplomacy, and economic competitiveness. For example, we have a scholar who is fulfilling their service requirement at the Department of Commerce. The program provides scholars with um, career skills training. Um, so during the uh, academic portion of the program, there's a career skills uh, training class. And um, during and after the program, scholars also receive job search assistance from the Defense Language National Security Education Service Team. Um, a little bit about the career skills course. Uh, you can expect learning uh, how to use uh, online tools for the job search, how to evaluate positions, how to research agencies, um, how to prepare the targeted documents for an application, and uh, honing interview skills. Um, scholars also have access to career counseling with the EHLS career counselor, and um, there's a 
Friday speaker series. So there are guest speakers from various government agencies that come and present their agency every Friday. Um, there are exclusive job opportunities, like I mentioned before, on a portal uh, that only EHLS scholars have access to, and also access to exclusive career fairs at federal agencies. So it is uh, your responsibility to find uh, the position. Uh, so we will not find a job for you. Uh, but like I said, um, we have the Friday speaker series um, and the um, agencies come to speak and are interested in hiring scholars of the program. So we have a relationship with a broad set of federal agencies and federal contractors who are interested in hiring EHLS scholars. Uh, the program exists for a reason. It exists because um, people uh, like you are needed to help support national security. So after EHLS, you're not alone. Delencio um, will still be helping you. You'll have exclusive job opportunities and career advice uh, available through the uh, portal that I mentioned before. And um, a lot of information and opportunities uh, for scholars to report um, what uh, the way they've uh, fulfilled their uh, service requirement. Um, career fairs, mentorship programs, letters of certification that you can provide to potential employers that say you're a graduate of EHLS, uh, sp specific hiring authorities, um, which is called Schedule A, which you can look up. Um, and um, the Lencio can also review resume, help you with cover letters, uh, provide with career search consultation um, by phone or in person. It's been it's been done a little more um, virtually now. Uh, so now that I've given an overview of the program, I'll say that the application is now open. So you can see our website for the link. The deadline to apply and to submit your supporting documents is 5 p.m. Eastern time on July 6, 2023. Once your application is submitted and considered complete, you'll be invited to schedule an oral proficiency interview in English. Oral proficiency interviews are gonna be administered through July 21st. But we highly recommend submitting your application and scheduling an oral proficiency interview as soon as possible to receive a time that works with your schedule. EHLS staff will notify candidates of their status in September. Some candidates will be provisionally selected to move on to skills testing. In late September to early October, provisionally selected candidates will complete language testing on a, and a basic technology test. You'll also complete an additional oral proficiency interview in your critical language in September and October. Uh, we will notify candidates of your final status in early November of 2023. And the program will start January 8 of 2024. So I don't see any questions in the chat, but um, I'll take a quick pause for people to digest this information. Great, I did actually have a couple of questions. Oh, great, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, these positions don't necessarily have to be language enabled positions. As I understood it, you're saying they don't necessarily have to be language instructor or translator. They could be a variety of other roles, right? Yeah, it's possible that you end up with a position in which you don't use your job, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it depends on uh, your own interests and what you uh, seek out in terms of the positions that you apply for. Okay, great. Uh, and then with the purpose of the program um, being able to support and prepare individuals to be able to support essentially defense agencies, right? You did mention that you could potentially work at a civilian agency if you are not able to secure uh, a position within a defense 
uh, role. So could you give a, a few examples of maybe those agencies like an HHS, would that qualify? Any other examples you could give? Um, I actually don't have any examples of civilian agencies. I think um, I think they're kind of looked at on a case by case basis. Okay. So they're not necessarily like advertised as like this is where each of our scholars has been and these are all the agencies um, like outside of the government. We don't really have that kind of available in terms of um, where people go. But um, I, if if you can make kind of an argument that um, your position has national security responsibilities, um, then then uh, NSEP or the funder would review that and see if uh, if that position um, fulfills the requirement. Or um, I I could mention federal contractors. I don't know if that falls into civilian. <laughs> right. So I guess if for example a federal contractor was doing work work with DOD or um, the intelligence community, that would qualify. Definitely, yes. Okay. Um, I, I go in a later slide about uh, federal contractor um, uh, details, yes. All right, we do have a couple of questions here in the chat as well. There's one, um, what exactly do the skills test? What, what are they testing? Yes, so um, we call it skills testing because there's a lot of testing, including uh, the, um, the uh, technology skills test, uh, but it's kind of a broad term because we have basically technology skills, your critical language, um, OPI, so or proficiency interview, and then the rest of the testing is English testing. So it's uh, reading, writing, listening. It's um, it's proficiency testing on um, the uh, scale of proficiency that I'll go into detail in, in the later slides. Okay, great. And then an overview on how long this program is expected to take. Of course, from the slide you have on the screen, it would start in 2024. Is it expected to go the length of that year? And then a follow-up on, are you able to work during this program time? Yeah, so um, you the program is from January through um, June in person in Washington, DC. And then um, the, la the two following months of July, August are in um, part-time online, uh, but the whole program is is eight months. Um, and you need to, even though if if you're online at the end um, and you're no longer um, in in the DC area, um, you, you do need to come back in August for graduation uh, in person. And the second question was, are you able um, to work during the program? Yes. yes. So you're not able to work during uh, the program. Um, you uh, you have to um, to sign a um, a letter uh, saying that you you're not um, holding any any position during the program, and um, it would not be possible <laughs> to work during the program. This is a very intensive program, and um, the schedule is nine to five um, with homework and a full ded dedication of our scholars. Um, it would it would just not be possible to hold a job at the same time. Okay, you did mention earlier in the presentation uh, there would be stipends, right? Correct. Yes, okay. every scholar receives a stipend. Um, so um, we. Um, accept 18 scholars every year. So all 18 scholars re receive a stipend. So that's $3,600 a month during the first six months and then 1,200 in the last two months. Okay. So as an effort to essentially supplement what you're not able to work and earn uh, as part of a participant in this program. Okay. Yes. And then, yeah, it can help you find a place to live and food and yeah. <laughs> great. And then is this program for career uh, entry level or would it be suitable for mid-career professionals? Uh, yes, we actually have a, a lot of our scholars are kind of mid-career uh, mid professionals. Um, there's no age limit for the program. Um, so yeah, you can you can apply kind of as the eligibility says, kind of as soon as you have a bachelor's degree, you're eligible um, and you can apply. And then there's no there's no limit after that. Okay, great. And to reiterate, you mentioned you could come from you know any background. It could be a technical background, science, whatever industry you may currently be in. Um, this program would uh, accept pending the other requirements. 
Yes, yes, that's correct. And and it's also kind of um, flexible in terms of um, of the level um, that you could have because if if you're mid career, then you know the program kind of gives you all these opportunities, and then it's kind of for you to kind of find that position that's going to be equivalent to kind of a stepping stone from from what your previous experience that's going to play into your job search, of course. Um, so uh, it's just kind of a, a step step in your career and and kind of a, a booster there for you. Sounds good. And we have a couple more questions. Very great um, pointed questions. I think it's really helping to to provide. Um, good information. So do these credits that are earned as part of this program, can they be applied anywhere else, for example, toward a master's program? No. So this is a non-credit bearing program. It's a uh, it's um, a certification. So you get a certificate um, and from Georgetown University. Um, and that certificate in itself opens a lot of doors, um, especially in the D.C. area. Wonderful. And then is health insurance provided for free or is a premium for the health insurance? So uh, there is um, there is insurance uh, through Georgetown University for the scholar. Um, if you have any dependents, that would have to be out of pocket. But for scholars, yes. That's covered. Okay. Wonderful. I think we have went through uh, the questions that we have so far. I encourage everyone. These are great questions. Please continue to drop them in the chat. Uh, and Matilda, I'll let you get back to uh, the rest of these slides here. Amazing, yes. Let's see. So now doing more of a broader presentation on developing skills for the government. So the federal government offers many options for training and for moving across different roles and topics, and sometimes more than in the private sector. Here are a few professional skills to keep in mind. In terms of interview skills, um, it's worth knowing that government interviewers really value previous work experience and how you describe your abilities over a specific degree or school background. In terms of job search, if you have a broad goal but aren't sure what government job is a good fit, uh, read through different job descriptions and requirements to find opportunities and focus your search. Getting your foot in the door. Um, it's often easier to get hired for a government job when you have a foot in the door already through a volunteer or contracting position, an internship or a scholarship. Now, here are a few language skills to keep in mind. Uh, to learn professional vocabulary, look online for articles written by and videos from proficient speakers working in your field, and pick sentences to try out and use. Knowing any language variety of a language is not only useful for getting a government job, but um, will also help provide a foundation to learn a different variety. Uh, read and keep up with current events. Um, for example, um, language analysts, um, it might be helpful for them to read news reports, social media postings outside of work to keep up with current events and language use. Uh, language skills are a tool to ensure you have a positive impact. Uh, for instance, members of the military with language skills bring empathy and the ability to engage with local people, not just through foreign defense operations, but also positive engagements with allies and humanitarian missions. Now I'll talk about the uh, interagency language roundtable. Uh, so this is um, a proficiency scale that you may encounter not only through your process um, applying to EHLS, uh, but um, in, the, in the federal workplace. Uh, it's a language proficiency scale tailored to the federal workplace. Um, it measures proficiency in terms of language use and control. Um, people who learned any language at an early age will not automatically be operating at a level five, which is the highest level. I'll cover the five levels in the next slide. 
Um, note that language, uh, government language testers are trained to view all varieties and accents of a language as equal to ensure accessibility. And examinees can type a request a test review if they're concerned about bias in the assessment. This uh, link, and you can just look up ILR government scale. Um, I really recommend uh, checking their website because there's a lot of information about the skills for each level of the scale. And it can really help you prepare for any language test and any opportunity to describe your level in the language. So this is the scale. The scale has six base levels from zero to five, and there are plus levels in between. To qualify for EHLS, you'll need to receive a score of at least two, which is limited working proficiency on all four English language skills tests. Uh, so those are the skills tests we mentioned before. So listening, reading, writing, and speaking. Um, you'll de demonstrate your English speaking in the first stage of the application. Uh, you'll need to receive a score of at least three, which is general professional proficiency on the speaking test in your critical language. So now um, I'm gonna go over some few tips. Uh, research agencies and roles, create a USA Jobs account and search for jobs. Research the places that you're applying to on um, websites like Glassdoor or LinkedIn. Uh, prepare for secu security clearance requirements. Uh, it's um, usually a lengthy process, so this will help you save time once the process starts and search agency specific websites and Ill intelligence careers is also a website that lists a few agencies that you can look at so here are some um, search engines uh, that you also can take advantage of in your search and some federal contracting agencies that can be kind of your step um, in the door um, your foot in the door and uh, are also kind of answering that previous question um, in the Q&A. Those are um, agencies that have provided scholars with uh, positions where 80% of their position was um, with national security responsibilities. And so that fulfilled the requirement. So those are some um, agencies that uh, you can research and you can look at their job openings and descriptions. Um, a federal resume is a different type of resume, so it's worth um, writing uh, writing your resume according to those standards. Uh, and there's a template on USA Jobs that you can download and you can um, and you can practice. Uh, so, of course, you list your previous jobs. When you list them, you uh, describe your duties and responsibilities, and most importantly, you quantify your accomplishments. So uh, you would say something like successfully wrote five reports over the course of one year. So as many details as possible and quantifiable details. Uh, reference keywords from the job description in your application and customize your resume for each application. Like I said, use the uh, resume builder that you can find on, on USA Jobs and uh, proofread your resume, ask others um, to proofread your resume, give you feedback. Uh, in terms of interviewing skills, informational interview is a great way to practice your interviewing skills. Discuss the knowledge, skills, and abilities in the job description when you're in, in the interview. And practice um, responses to interview questions and prepare for video and digital interviews. Um, prepare for that format, because that is a, a more common format nowadays. Uh, look into related jobs, jobs at federal contractors, jobs in local or state government or NGOs. Apply to jobs with similar titles and skills. Uh, apply to other roles in your target agency. Explore part-time and temporary job with your target agency or contractors and volunteer in the community. And network. Um, so join language clubs, 
um, get involved in uh, local language community, uh, NLSC, uh, if um, you, um, I encourage you to look up, it's the National Language uh, Service Corps. Uh, if you're a speaker of any, any language, you can join uh, this network um, to uh, connect with, with other, other speakers of different languages. And of course, uh, YEP is a great network, uh, a great place to network. Um, attend career fairs and networking events. Uh, look for mentors. Connect with professionals on LinkedIn. Um, make sure your approach is personal if you're contacting someone on LinkedIn. Um, add another profile in your language on LinkedIn. Yep, so those were the tips. Um, I'm kind of bringing it back to EHLS. This is a screenshot of our uh, website. So this is where you can apply. Um, you'll find a lot of information on how to prepare to apply. Um, all the components of the application, the documents required, all the steps in the timeline of the application cycle. And um, finally, follow us uh, on social media. We announce uh, events like this one, webinars, uh, Q and A's, um, opportunities to learn to learn more about the program and network on our social media and our newsletter that you can find on our website. And then if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me um, and I can also reroute you. But if you have any questions uh, specifically on the curriculum, the schedule of uh, Georgetown facilities, um, my colleague uh, Marie at Georgetown uh, can answer those questions. And then um, I'm kind of the contact person for any, any questions regarding testing. Uh, and my colleague Anna Gay at Institute of International Education is uh, the best point of contact for any questions on the online application system. And um, I see that we have plenty of time for, for questions. So any questions on those topics now, I'm very happy to answer as well. And yes, I'll leave it open for more questions now. Thanks, Matilda. Feel free to go ahead and drop uh, your questions in the chat or raise your hand and I'll go ahead and unmute you. In the meantime, I did have a couple of questions. Uh, so your slide that was related to the career counseling and some of the other support that the program would provide, how long after the completion of the program will scholars still have access to such support? That's a good question. I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure it's, as an alumni, you still have access to the portal and through that portal to uh, NSEP support. Um, actually, we uh, we had a, a Q and A uh, with one of our alumni guests who who I think she mentioned in passing that she was still receiving announcements of you know job opportunities that she could still apply for, uh, mm -hmm. and she was an alumni from 2019. Wow, that's definitely good support <laughs> over the years. <laughs> Sounds great. And then uh, the second question is related to the application date. So you had a slide that laid out, of course, the upcoming application cycle. I wanted to check, will the next application cycle follow the same July timeframe, just in case we have attendees that may not be ready this July, but would definitely be interested in pursuing it potentially next year? Definitely. Yes, we've been following the same uh, schedule for uh, 19 years now. And um, yeah, we're going to keep going. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Any other questions, please feel free to uh, go ahead and drop them in the chat. Um, just to recap, you mentioned a lot of really good resources in terms of uh, resume building, job searching, USA Jobs was one that you recommended. Um, could you maybe uh, capture a couple of more uh, resources that you think might be helpful, especially in the job searching opportunity? I think that's where a lot of folks may need um, some information. Yeah. Um... I'm trying to think. I think um, on our website we have a we have a, um, a tab that's uh, called "Working for the Government." That might be a good starting point because we have uh, both a few links to kind of look up um, GS levels, so like pay scale. So that's kind of an interesting one for people to kind of research and see what what that can look like. And then um, we also have a list of um, different agencies where our alumni have found. Um, have found a position 
positions and um yeah they're not you know all like intelligence com uh, community that we have this, this very broad kind of um um understanding of fulfilling the requirement and then you know scholars go through to uh, other career opportunities so um so that's that's a good place to kind of look up um I think a lot of government websites kind of link to each other. So you start with one, especially like intelligence community, that website, you start there and you'll like in five minutes, you'll have like 10 tabs open with like all those other websites that you can look at. Great, uh, wealth of uh, information. <laughs> uh, we have one question here. Uh, so once an application is submitted, is it possible to withdraw just in case um, they may not be interested in pursuing this application year and potentially reapply next year? Yes. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, the the program is you know a hard commitment. You have to be full time. You have to be in person. Um, we often say you know you have to kind of not be the one doing groceries for those six months or, you know, not necessarily the one doing child care for those six months because you're just be so busy and committed. Um, so it's, it's you know, difficult arrangements and they don't necessarily align with your schedule that year. Uh, so if you've been accepted, you're able to decline and then you'll be able to apply a following year. Um, if you accept, but then um, don't, follow through, uh, you'll not be able to reapply. And your application will not be deferred, right? You'll have to reapply. Mm -hmm. And it's a very competitive uh, program. It's uh, only 18 scholars every year. Um, so we do we do encourage people to reapply because obviously there's more than 18 people every year that could get into the program. But um, this is our, our funding that allows for, for the stipend for 18 people. Um, how would you say is the success rate with this program, especially if you could talk about any um, folks from the Ethiopian community that may have participated in the program and highlights to share? Yeah, I, I, I wish I had examples from the Ethiopian community. Um, I, I have kind of a, a cool success story, I think, um, is um, an alumni. Her name is Matilda, too. So I always, I always remember her. <laughs> um, um, who's um who's a, a great spokesperson um in, in the NSEP alumni um kind of networks um on, on LinkedIn and everything. And um I believe she's from South Sudan and um she so I didn't go into too much detail about it today, but um part of the instruction and we we go we go into detail on 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 more of like the instruction um in other webinars, um, and we actually have one tomorrow if you want, <laughs> want to register uh, on our website. Um, part of the instruction is, is a, um, a research project where you're paired with a mentor and you research um, uh, a topic that's specific to your area of the world and your mentor that's at a federal agency is interested in your language expertise and your cultural expertise. Um, and so you work with them and you create this report and you present it at the end of the program in front of the intelligence community. So that in itself is a great networking opportunity. And so this scholar in, in particular was able uh, to get a job just, just from that. <laughs> just her mentor was just so happy with, uh, with the work that she did that she got a job. Um, and then I think she worked at the Library of Congress and then the CDC. So it, it just was a very... Um, very cool career. Yeah, <laughs> and no, that, it's that's, been going. <laughs> that's great to hear. Um, with her transition, actually, that raises a question for me. So when she left the IC, she moved into CDC. Once you fulfill that one year requirement within a defense agency, if yeah. you have the opportunity to move into a civilian agency, you can do that, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Great. Uh, and then if you could just reiterate um, the stipend uh, for the program for that first six months in person and the last two months online. Yeah, so it's $3,600 um, a month for the first six months, uh, so January through June, and then $1,200 for the last two months, July, August. Wonderful. All right, uh, we'll go ahead and take any other last questions. In the meantime, I do want to plug here at Yep, we also have a career development program where we provide resources and information. Uh, so please do get connected with us. I'll go ahead and drop the link to our website where you can find the link to register to our career newsletter called Elevate. So again, on a monthly basis, directly to your inbox, you get 
get information around jobs, different opportunities that may be coming out and relevant to you in your job search. So definitely stay connected with us. And of course, um, there's a wealth of information here on the uh, program website that Matilda has on the screen as well. So we definitely encourage you to, to connect and engage if you have interest in this uh, program. Yeah, I think it's it's the best uh, way to kind of network with through through your organization and and others is is really a, a really good step to having successful careers. Yeah, absolutely, and we appreciate the partnership and you spending some time to share this information with us. Um, so, with that said, I'll I'll go ahead and um, again thank you, Matilda, for your time. I'd also like to thank everyone that attended tonight for your great questions, your participation. Uh, we do plan to host more of these personal development webinars, so please stay connected with us. Follow us on social media at YEP Network so you can see what we are up to and uh, join the programs and attend our in-person events that may be relevant to you. Uh, so that's my final plug. I'll, I'll pass it to you, Matilda, if you wanted to say any final uh, notes. Yeah, um, I I feel like there's you know still a lot to to cover. Like I said, you know details on on kind of the schedule, the instruction, um, more about the service requirement. Um, uh, like I said, there there are these um, these special hiring authorities. Um, so these are things that we cover in our webinar tomorrow. Um, and if you register and you can't attend, we'll send a recording. Um, so um, uh, yes. I think the more you know, the more you um, follow us on social media, the more you kind of stay connected, the more successful your application will be. Um, so uh, we're here to help. Um, I'm always here to answer any questions um, and, and to help. So please feel free to reach out. And I'm always very excited when people reach out. So please reach out. <laughs> and we do have one final question uh, related to security clearance, does the program provide support in earning any security clearance that may be required for a position? That's a great question. Um, so uh, the security clearance uh, will be processed with the agency that hires you after the program. Um, so uh, we're not able to provide it uh, for you. Um, but like I said, it's a process that you can start as soon as you can. So, um, you know, even before entering the program, it's worth um, getting getting that information ready uh, for when you will be asked a uh, security uh, clearance. So um, information about um, past uh, travel and past position, um, things like that, uh, you, you might wanna start getting that ready. Yeah, great. Yeah, I, I will say on a personal note, I have had to fill out a couple of those uh, forms. So there are definitely ones to prepare for, gather as much information as you can ahead of time um, to be able to submit it uh, and not experience any delays. So here in the chat, I'm dropping our link to our career newsletter, Elevate, as well as the EHLS uh, website so you have it easily accessible. Again, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Matilda. I appreciate your time. Thank you to all our attendees. And we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Have a great evening. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.